So let's go ahead and kick off this unit. We'll be talking about palms first before we get to trees and all the, uh, the tree-related forestry things as well further on. We'll go ahead and kick it off, talk about an introduction to palms. And what we've got here is probably more geared towards the, the biology of the plants and how they're different than trees in a lot of ways. So palms uh, on the left here, you can see the state seal. There's a sable palmetto, which is the state tree. And you've even got saw palmettos down at the bottom of it. And, you know, we, we, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pal palm symbolism in uh, all sorts of seals for different municipalities, counties, cities, et cetera. And in addition, there's tons of native palms and non-native palms that do very, quite well here in Florida. And uh, South Carolina is technically a palmetto state, but I think uh, John Muir once said that uh, Florida is the true home to palms. And so there's a lot to cover here uh, since they're a pretty big part of the landscape that we have. So palms belong to uh, the division of flowering plants commonly referred to as monocotyledons or monocots. Uh, some other examples of monocots are grasses, uh, orchids, onions, things that tend to grow a vascular system that's very linear. And one of the big things that show that you'll notice with these plants is that when they initially germinate, they have a single cotyledon or a seed leaf that emerges. So that's the mono part, as opposed to dicotyledons or dicots is another division of flowering plants. And they have two leaves that show up, the di. So when a dicot um, emerges, yeah, it's got those two seed leaves. And I guess palms are technically referred to as arborescent. So tree-like monocots. And However, palms have more in common with like a corn plant or a banana, some other monocots uh, than they do with oak trees. And this means the anatomy of palms and how they grow is very different from the broadleaf trees. And so because of that, you can see that their morphology and anatomy, uh, so internal structure, in, internal structure are quite distinct and they've got unique nutritional needs as well related to that. But they're technically all within one family of plants here within Eric AC. So in all plants, uh, water moves up the xylem and carbohydrates like that are produced via photosynthesis, the energy, they move down through the phloem. So in general, whatever is moving in the xylem is moving up. Whereas whatever is moving in the phloem is moving down. Dicots, such as broadleaf trees, right? Like you'll see here, they have a vascular cambium, which is this red line. So in all plants, water moves through the xylem and carbohydrates that are produced through photosynthesis move through the phloem. Um, in general, uh, whatever is moving in the xylem is moving up whereas whatever is moving in the phloem is moving down. So dicots, uh, which broadleaf trees are a part of, I want to point out here, they typically have something called a vascular cambium, which is this red line here. And it forms a breakdown between the xylem and the phloem. So the xylem is shown here in pink. The phloem is this part here uh, that's green, and it continually expands outward as the tree grows. It's basically used to uh, grow, make the tree grow wider horizontally, uh, while the tree at the same time is growing taller vertically. And so this is in quite uh, contrast 
with what palms do. Palms, they they basically have one part of it, the plant that acts as the main node of growth. And so basically they just keep moving upwards and they don't grow outwards vertically at all. But so in contrast here, the, like this, this palm tree, this cross section of a trunk, uh, they don't grow outward at all. Um, they've got no vascular cambium. And you can see that the that these little bundles right here, those are actually the xylem and the phloem together. They grow in these little bundles. And once the bundle is formed, there is no additional or new xylem and phloem formed in the bundle. So as the palm tree increases in height, the xylem and phloem tissue extends in length also. And so another analogy that you might be able to think of is a palm is a little bit like a concrete pole. Uh, you have got metal rods that, that tend to run all the way up it and support the pole. And so that's kind of what like these vascular bundles are like. Um, inside of this, this other stuff that's going on here, uh, that's the filler, it's called the parenchyma. And these cells are like water balloons. They expand and contract depending on the amount of water outside of the palm trunk. Um, it is the permanent expansion of some parenchyma cells that provides an increase in diameter of palm trunks. So you can see it sometimes like different parts of the palm trunk might have different uh, widths that is related to this parenchyma. So as I kind of mentioned earlier, like the, the xylem and phloem are together in these bundles. And uh, as you can see, this cortex, this is their parenchyma is, that's where um, there are no bundles. If you were to zoom in on the bundles, this is what they would look like. So here's a, mi a microscopic view. And if you were to go even further, you can see uh, what the, the vascular bundles look like. And then what in uh, the vascular bundles being surrounded by these parenchyma cells. So what we've got here is a cross section of a pygmy date palm, Phoenix robolini. And the big thing we wanna point and bring to your attention are these little vascular bundles that are distributed all throughout the trunk. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Each of these little dots represents uh, some of the vascular bundles. However, in other palms, like our native cabbage palm that are larger, typically you've got more vascular bundles that are concentrated to the outside area of the trunk and fewer vascular bundles in the middle of the trunk. So, and another thing here is the outside of it, this epidermis uh, cortex area, uh, technically, Palms don't have bark. They've got something that's more of a pseudo bark. And it's a combination of epidermis and cortex. And it doesn't really have a huge uh, function. Like it, there's no vascular uh, parts of the plant within it. So technically it doesn't really in inhibit the plant from doing a lot of its core functions, but it can be unsightly if, uh, there starts to be anything uh, that breaks down on the outside of it. It's just mostly aesthetic. So here's some palm morphology, um, breaking palms down into two of the biggest classifications or uh, distinctions between different types of palms are those with a crown shaft and those that do not have a crown shaft. Um, the, they both have trunks. All palms have these trunks for the most part. And however, the crown shaft is a tubular or cylindrical shaft above the trunk and below the crown. So it's this green part of the palm here on this royal palm. 
and it consists of the leaf bases of all the leaves that are pressed presently on the palm. And the crown is the sum of the leaves at the top of the trunk. So something to keep in mind with the crown shaft is a, a lot of times the more uh, tropical and less cold hardy plants have this type of, of feature on them as opposed to the saw, you know, like the, the sable palmetto here, they typically don't have an exposed green crown shaft like that. So some other features uh, that have are common names or things to, to be aware of here when talking about morphology or the spear, which is a, a leaf that basically hasn't been able to unfurl yet. Uh, the leaf, which is also known as a frond. Uh, the crown shaft we talked about. Inflorescence. So this is the, the flowering part, the stalk of the flower, like the, the flowers are on. Then on the trunk, uh, you have these leaf scars that go across them that are very distinct in a lot of palms. So all these can kind of potentially be identifying features to help you differentiate different types of palms from one another. So the leaf that's at, at the top here, this is a hand life leaf or a palmate leaf. Um, Mexican fan palm, uh, Washington, Washingtonias, they have, an ex they are a good example of a palm with this type of leaf. The blade of the leaf is directly attached to the pedial. So the pedial is the, the part of the tree, part of the leaf that connects to the tree. So you can see everything goes through this one attachment here at the pedial base. So a costa palmate leaf, which is what uh, we commonly see around here with sable palms, it basically, uh, you have a portion of the pedial that extends all the way down uh, and, and attaches to the rest of the leaf segment. And that is called the costa, so you can see here. And it, the leaflets are fused together, forming an entire leaf segment. So in the, the final class of different types of palm leaves is the, the pinnate leaf. So the pinnate is feather. And an example of palms that have these little leaflets on them would be uh, basically like the royal palm, uh, foxtail palms, and the phoenix palms. So here's a photo of a wild date palm or a phoenix sylvestris um, that's been dug up from a field nursery in preparation for transplanting. Large diameter roots grow horizontally or descend into the soil from the trunk. And they are primarily roots that anchor the palm. So you can see the, at the bottom here, these larger roots that, that kind of grip into the soil. Uh, Whereas further you go up the, the base of the, the rooting area, below ground area of the palm, you get into these finer type of roots. And smaller roots grow up and are located in the top six inches of the soil. And these roots are the ones that are primarily concerned with taking up nutrients and water. Uh, palms do, do not have root hairs but they do have these very fine rootlets. So palm roots grow from the trunk as much as 50 feet away, uh, but therefore palm roots are intermingled with the turf grass roots and any other plant roots in the typical homeowner landscape. Um, it's important to keep that in mind uh, as that means any fertilizer that's applied to turf grass can also be taken up by the palm. And the same goes for any herbicides that are laid out in lawns as well. They can negatively affect uh, the, the palm as well. So another important distinction between palms and, and most other uh, 
plants out there is uh, particularly broadleaf trees is where they concentrate their growth. Palms typically only have one apical meristem, uh, and that's that's the bud or the, the the palm heart, and it's 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 directly at the top of the the base of the stem, typically. Um, lateral meristems only at the base of clustering palm species. So yeah, you can get it that occur in some of the palms that that basically uh, form clumps or thickets. Um, I guess in some rare exceptions, you might have uh, some aerial branching that occurs within this one uh, genus of palms. However, broadleaf trees, anytime you look at branches throughout them, uh, there are apical meristems all over the place on those things. And then there are uh, well, lateral meristems that, that form the branching and the apical meristem is typically your dominant leadering stem for a lot of trees. And a lot of trees don't even form that very well. They'll, they'll um, depending, it just really depends on what type of tree form you're looking at, uh, excurrent or decurrent. So here is an example of a species of palm that would still also have these meristems at the base, uh, Erica palms. Uh, you'll see these quite a bit in South Florida. Uh, in contrast, uh, it's more common for the most part to see palms that that are like this queen palm here. Uh, they don't have any lateral meristems. They've just got the apical meristem at the top. All the growth for that, you know, anything for that tree to persist has to come from up there. And then sometimes it can get a little confusing. Sometimes people plant trees together in clumps, but they're actually to make them uh, a little bit more, uh, give a sense of fullness. And it's an aesthetic reason for doing this more than anything. But really these palms are actually individuals. They didn't come from the same spot. And Whereas this, this palm over here, it's genetically all the same individual. Uh, these Christmas palms were just planted together just for looks, basically. So on the left-hand side here, you've got a hyphen A uh, genus tree, and or palm tree, rather. And this palm genus has above-ground lateral meristem. It's one of the few that actually does this. And... I guess uh, it's kind of normal for certain palms we have here. Gingerbread palm in South Florida will do this. And, but this is definitely the exception. Uh, it's not very common. Sometimes in the landscape, you'll see sable palms that will, will do something similar. But this is more, it happens more by accident than anything. This occurs when the bud is damaged at some point oftentimes by insects, and it starts to split up and grow outwardly from there. And this is not a normal way for these plants to grow. It's not part of their normal biology. And actually, it, it hasn't really even been demonstrated that we can do this if we wanted to in cultivation. It's just something that kind of happens uh, via accident. So the number of leaves produced and retained is typically a function of the palm species and the environment, um, and especially that of nutrition. And in general, for every visible leaf, there's an equal number of leaves in development in the apical meristem. So if you damage the apical meristem, you're affecting the leaves that have yet to emerge. Uh, also, removing visible leaves by pruning removes a source of nutrition for the leaves that are in development a lot of the time. Uh, a new leaf will live for at least two years, usually longer. However, this is determined by the palm species and the nutritional health of the palm. This is also influenced uh, by the normal temperature environment where the palm is growing. 
So for example, a healthy coconut palm in Southern Florida will produce one leaf, one leaf every five weeks. If you were to put it in Central Florida, there would be a longer interval between leaf production for the coconut palm, especially throughout the colder months of the year. So we, we've got a longitudinal cross-section in this photo of uh, basically the apical meristem cut in half here. And basically this is all the bud or the heart of the palm. The white arrow here is pointing towards a, an inflorescence that was the flowering portion that you see developing on the sides sometimes of the palms. So that's, that's what it looks like when it's in development. And then beneath here um, in this orange half circle, this is the true part of the meristem in formation. And it basically, it's just an area that is full of quickly dividing cells. Uh, you could think of it also, and these cells can form all different parts of the plant. They're almost like stem cells, but for plants, basically. And you can see that, like, yeah, there's also, this is going on to form uh, leaves, it looks like, as well here. So within palms, you can have three different potential locations, depending on the species of where the inflorescences and the fruit can come out of. You've got terminal, which come through the above the canopy. Uh, you can have them within the canopy uh, in the leaf axle or below the crown shaft. So overall, there's two different flowering patterns. Uh, Hapaxanthic palm will flower and then the palm will begin to die. Uh, and this could be quite a shock to a person if they're not aware that the tree that they've got uh, it has this type of flowering pattern. On the other hand, you've got pleonanthic palms, and they'll continuously flower. And you can potentially have some palms that are continuously always producing flowers throughout the year, kind of like the coconut palm, or uh, some of these will maybe only produce like one flush uh, flowers and fruit a year, like the sable palmetto.